Any health-related information on the following show provides general information only. Content presented on any show by any host or guest should not be substituted for a doctor's advice. Always consult your physician before beginning any new diet, exercise, or treatment program. Joni Aldridge and welcome to Treatment SOS. So glad to have you with us today, wherever you are in the world, to talk about a very exciting topic. Um, but first, I want to introduce my co-host for Treatment SOS, Dr. Peter Hofflin, publisher and editor of Oncozine, the International Oncology Network for Cancer and Hematology News. Uh, welcome, Peter. Nice to have you uh, have me in the show. Thank you very much. It's a very exciting topic today. You know, um, I was thinking back today, and I remember the first time I was sitting in a meeting of the North Carolina Comprehensive Cancer Organization, and an oncologist was speaking to the group, and he said that a high percentage of cancers are either overtreated or undertreated. You know. I never really had stopped to think about it. I know that um, until we get to a place where we can more determine, and when I say we, the medical community, not me per se, um, the medical community as a whole, until they can get to the point where they can actually look at a tumor and determine its actual specifics. You know, I realize when I think about it, that there is not a specific science or an exact science for treatment. But then I would think about my husband and the three horrific stem cell transplants he went through. And when you think of it in those terms, um, you know, it, it's pretty bad. Yet the state, the next statement uh, was that undertreatment was actually worse than overtreatment because it risks the life of the patient. You know, research has discovered that many men now with prostate cancer in certain circumstances will die of other causes before the prostate cancer itself kills them. Now the same questions are being discussed about breast cancer. Yeah, and, and it is very important to realize uh, the issues of overtreatment and undertreatment and overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis uh, because uh, this, this really is not just a cost picture for healthcare in, in general, uh, but it is very important also what you alluded to earlier. Um, if, if you don't have any treatment, that's really a risk for the life of the patient. If you have overtreatment, it may include treatments that the patient may receive, which may not be necessary or avoidable. And and with that are the costs, but also a lot of other issues that are, we've discussed those things in earlier shows. And one of the interesting things is in December, we had a series of meetings from the American Society of Hematology, but also the, the San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference in San Antonio. And and, and the issues of over-treatment and under-treatment was also uh, mentioned in those conferences. And it's definitely something that... that um, physicians need to pay attention to. And, you know, it's amazing that we're talking about this uh, in the 21st century. I mean, you would think that we would have come further than this. But, you know, the other thing that I kept thinking of as I was reviewing the information today, um, you know, recently I had my own surgical breast biopsy. And I remember sitting in the office with my potential surgeon, and I did end up um, letting her do the surgery, um, and her sitting there looking at me and saying, without ever seeing the cells at all, only having seen the pathology report from the core needle biopsy, that I would need to meet with an oncologist, and I could possibly have to go on breast cancer prevention drugs. Um, of course, it turned out that neither one of those was necessary, but it couldn't help but wonder how many people have treatment 
that it's actually not necessary. Cancer is a scary disease. Fear is a powerful motivator. And, you know, for these reasons, I'm very excited to discuss uh, today's topic of genomic testing, particularly for breast cancer, and how it can take some of the guesswork out of breast cancer treatment and recurrence, uh, which is so terrifying for so many cancer patients. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Dr. James V. Pelicane, and he's the Director of Breast Oncology at the Bon Secours Cancer Institute in Richmond, Virginia. He's a board certified by the American Board of Surgery, a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, and a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Welcome, Dr. Pelicane. Uh, thank you very much, Joni. So this is a fascinating topic. I mean, it truly is. Uh, and, you know, it seems far out there. It seems late getting here in many ways. Um, it was fascinating reading um, press releases and articles uh, about this this morning. And I was thinking, thank goodness. I really was. I was saying, uh, you know, I'm so glad that we're to this point. So tell us, what is genomic testing, sometimes called molecular diagnostics? And when it comes to breast cancer, what's the difference between genetic testing and genomic testing? Well, the, the both, both of you have touched on, on a number of very important topics, especially as it relates to breast cancer. And oftentimes, uh, there is a confusion between genetic testing and genomic testing. Genetic testing essentially is looking for one of two gene mutations or, or mutations on one or two genes that cause breast cancer. Uh, those namely the BRCA genes one and two. That, that would be considered genetic testing and certain people with high risk family histories or personal histories are candidates for that type of testing. Genomic testing is something that we do after a patient's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And essentially what it does is it tries to differentiate patients into groups of either high risk or low risk as relates to recurrence of their breast cancer into distant organs. Um, and, and it really helps with what you were mentioning earlier, <clears throat> the avoidance of overtreatment and undertreatment. So when you uh, look at those tests, and, and each test is, of course, uh, very specific, but when you look at those tests, and, and, and this goes directly to, uh, to, to what people may expect and hear in the media, is, is the term personalized medicine. Um, and, and how does, for example, I remember reading a whole series of articles um, uh, last year in, in The Oncologist, which is uh, a, a very interesting kind of peer-reviewed journal, but for the, for the, for, not everybody has access to those materials. So in, in, for this purpose, I mean, how does that, the test that you do and, and you work with, how does that have an impact on the, on the treatment and the diagnosis for criminal breast cancer? Well, personalized medicine really speaks to the type of cancer a patient has and, and not, not even the type, but what the likelihood of that cancer coming back is or what is it about that cancer that makes it different from someone else's cancer? And what we see in breast cancer is that the majority of breast cancers, we're going to cure no matter what we do. And we're going to cure them in spite of what we do. But there's a percentage of them, probably somewhere around 30% or so, that are going to need additional treatment. And, and what personalized medicine does, it looks at the individual's cancer. It looks at the specific cells of their cancer, and it looks at what's driving those cancers, what we call them pathways, what different molecular pathways are making those cells grow. And we can make a determination based on which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off, as to the likelihood of that cancer coming back. And then we, from that, we know that some patients are going to need more aggressive therapy. Some patients are going to need chemotherapy because they're going to respond better to it and it's going to reduce their risk of recurrence. And other patients are going to do well without chemotherapy. Uh, and, and so it really is a look at how cells act, how cancers act, as opposed to the way we have been doing it uh, 
which is to look at cells under the microscope and try to make a determination, try to extrapolate how the cells are going to act based on what they look like. There is some, um, there is some correlation. It's not, you know, we're not trying to repl replace standard pathology because there is a lot of information we get from the way cells look. Uh, but we get more information now, and we're learning so much more about it every day, about how to figure out how they're going, how the cells function, and how they're going to act biologically. So, when we're looking at genomic testing, um, first of all, let's talk about diagnosis and how can you use um, molecular diagnostic test. Um, with diagnosing breast cancer, and is that available now, or when might it be available? Well, it's interesting. You know, the pathologists still do the majority of heavy lifting when it comes to di the actual diagnosis of not just breast cancer, but all cancers, because the diagnosis is made visually, really. It, but once the diagnosis is made, then the the diagnosis, if you will, of the aggressiveness of the breast cancer or the likelihood of, of recurrence comes in. And that really, quite frankly, is equally as important, if not more important. You know, people don't die from breast cancer that remains localized in their breast. It's only when it spreads to a distant organ uh, that, that they have problems. And so our job, our challenge, is to identify who those patients are and treat them with appropriate treatments in order to reduce that risk. So when you when when you when you look at those tests and that kind of stuff, I mean, um, you, we were talking about the benefits earlier a little bit, but can you allude a little bit more? Can you explain a little bit more about about the 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 actual benefits of of, of the test or the genomic testing in that case? Absolutely. So let's just take for an example a patient that comes in uh, with a diagnosed breast cancer. <clears throat> so. We look at that patient, and then we want to know, um, and to your question earlier, these tests are available today, and they're available, and it should be available in any, any uh, cancer center or any breast center or any practice uh, that is practicing and treating breast cancer. But the benefits to these patients are we can look at a woman, for instance, and I'll give an example of one of these genomic tests called Mammaprint. And if you're a high-risk patient, we can tell that patient that on average, you have approximately 29% risk of your breast cancer recurring in the next 10 years. And if you uh, are willing to undergo cytotoxic or intravenous chemotherapy, we can reduce that risk significantly and bring your, um, your cure rate up, up into the, close to over 90%. So that's a real benefit for that patient who now knows uh, what their potential risk of recurrence is. And on the other end of the spectrum, if we have a patient that's low risk, we can look at them and say, with no treatment, with just surgery and local treatment, you know, uh, possibly radiation, you have an average recurrence risk at 10 years of 10%. That's with no treatment. If you take hormonal therapy, if you take tamoxifen or you take an aromatase inhibitor like Arimidex or Femera, you could potentially cut that risk by 50%. So your long-term risk of recurrence might only be 5% or less if you take this medicine for five years. And, we, and furthermore, we know that giving new cytotoxic or intravenous chemotherapy uh, is not really going to reduce your risk that much farther. And so, so the, the benefits to the patients, again, are identifying which patients are going to benefit from more aggressive treatment so as not to undertreat them and to identify which patients don't need that more aggressive treatment so as not to over-treat them. I mean, the cost of over-treatment, and you touched on this in your introduction, is not just financial. I mean, it is it, the financial aspect of it is enormous. When we look at, at patients that we give chemotherapy to or used to give chemotherapy to who didn't really need it, um, or the cost of what we call non-responders, patients who get chemotherapy and aren't really going to respond to the medicines we give, it's an enormous cost to the system, but the, the hidden cost is the, the, the non-financial burden, you know, the cognitive problems that people have. They mm -hmm. get foggy and their head gets foggy. They can't think as quick the way, as, as they used to. They get neuropathy. They get risks of other secondary cancers. There's a whole list of complications that you really can't put a cost on. And when, exactly. When you, 
And when, when you look at those things, it's like that. I mean, they, they obviously um, have a bearing on, on the patient themselves. Uh, if you look at the psychosocial impact of, of, of breast cancer, for example, I mean, it's not just the economic impact you mentioned, but it will also have an impact on on, on the patient's um, family, on, on, on their, their children, their spouse, on, on, on other family members that may be there. And so if you, if you look at the total health-related um, uh, cost in that respect, they may go way beyond um, – uh, the, the, the cancer itself and the treatment. How, how, what, what's, your, what's your opinion there? I totally agree with you. I mean, these, you know, sometimes we forget about the family. You know, we see, and the issue with breast cancer, like other cancers, I mean, there's no, there, there's no real differentiator between, between them, but breast cancer typically hits many women right in, in the prime of their life. It's going to hit women when they have young families. Many of these women are working outside, working outside the home. Um, and it does affect their children. Their, their children are, are very impressionable at this age. And, and, it, and they, they see their mother as being sick. They see, they worry, you know, and you talked about a little bit about fear. I mean, fear is uh, a, a, an unbelievable emotion. And we've caused some of this problem ourselves in the medical community. It's, it's, it's what, it's kind of the price we pay for uh, awareness. You know, we try to make people aware of breast cancer, but as a side effect of that awareness, we've created this fear. But it's interesting. I, we got a, I got a letter not too long ago, or the Bonds Corps Health System, the Cancer Institute, got a letter from from uh, the significant other of one of our patients, and and he said, I mean, he brought it up that. Uh, we tend to forget about, we don't forget about them, but we tend to be so focused on the patient, we, we tend to not pay as much attention to the family. And the family really goes through this every step of the way. And so the more we can do to limit treatments that are not going to be beneficial or not going to reduce risk, uh, the better off we're going to be long term, not only in treating the patient appropriately, but helping the family uh, cope. And I, I'd like to add to that, actually, because I know many cancer patients that come out of treatment because of chemotherapy um, and can't work because of neuropathy. And we're very much in a society now where you definitely need two incomes in a lot of cases to keep going. So the financial and the emotional and the physical impact um, is is definitely far-reaching because if, if a mother can't go back to, to work if she can't uh, go to her children's soccer practice because her feet and her her legs ache, you know, I mean, this makes a significant difference because let's face it, um, younger women are being diagnosed with breast cancer. And in, in the interesting thing in that respect is that it is not only uh, the, the mother that is affected in that respect, but think about, for example, the mother may have to go, m might not be able to drive uh, because of, of, of herself to the hospital or uh, need an assistance in, in some other ways. I mean, depending on what, on what, what the actual disease is in this case, um, but they may require somebody else to drive um, or uh, may, may, may other aspects that need to be done. So it is definitely kind of weighing very heavy on, on other people in that respect well and of course the family is the closest uh, that can can weigh on i think that's true i mean the, the financial burden goes well beyond the cost of the drugs there's there's no question about it lost lost days of work um, uh, you know family family losing time from work i mean these are these are important issues um, and you know they're they're appropriate issues to talk about and the timing is right. I mean, we have come such a long way just in breast cancer therapy. You know, when you look back just a few decades ago, you know, we were performing radical mastectomies on women. And the issue, of course, is we were doing what we thought was right at the time. So back in the 1940s, you know, that was the appropriate therapy because we didn't have an understanding. And as we move forward, you know, we went to modified radical mastectomies. We went to lumpectomy. And now we're trying to push the envelope as relates to radiation therapy. And we're doing the same thing now with chemotherapy and not necessarily um, not giving chemotherapy, but trying to decide, number one, who needs it and who's going to benefit from it. And then number two, eventually, you know, uh, which drugs to use. I mean, that's going to be next on the horizon. So let's let's go, let's go back a little bit to the, the the genomic testings that are available. I mean, 
Um, of course, we, we've made an, an, a huge uh, a kind of progress, scientific progress, medical progress in, in the last decades. But if you look, for example, at, at the first generation of genomic tests for breast cancer um, and a little bit more about the next generations that came afterwards, how, how do they differ? And, and, and how do you work in, in a different way with that? But how do they give you or the physician a different kind of, of, a different kind of information in that respect? Yes, absolutely. There and you know, there's there's a lot of controversy that surrounds this, and there there are believers on both sides of the aisle, if you will. But the first generation test, um, you know, commercially known as Oncotype or as a 21 gene test, was a revolutionary test. You know, it came out in early 2000. It looked at essentially 16 different genes that people knew at the time were important as related to breast cancer recurrence. So they looked at those genes, they started with about 250 genes, and they whittled it down to these 16 um, that seemed to be the most important to them and that performed well in the assay that they were doing. And then they, they created basically an algorithm that gave a nice uh, graph that put patients into one of three risk groups, either a low, intermediate, or high risk group. Uh, if you're a low risk, if you have a low risk oncotype score, you know, you don't need chemotherapy. I mean, you're going to do well uh, with just hormonal therapy, tamoxifen or Arimidex or Femera. If you are a high risk oncotype patient or have a high recurrence score, then the data suggests you will benefit from chemotherapy. The problem with the first generation test is it looked at genes that were already known in the literature. It looked at a small number of genes. And so there's a large group of patients that are what we call intermediate, have an intermediate oncotype score. And there's really no consensus. There's no data to suggest what to do with those patients. So when you, when you look at more sophisticated testing, and uh, namely the second generation test or mammoprint, and you run the mammoprint study, on those intermediates, you know, they're split about 50-50 high risk and low risk, but they're spread all over the board. So there's no real rhyme or reason to that group. Again, if you're low risk, you're good. If you're high risk, you know, you're good. Those, those results have been, have been very well validated over the years. It's just that intermediate group that's the stickler. The second generation test called Mammoprint was developed much differently. Instead of going to the literature or, or going to different genomic databases and looking for genes that we knew were important, what, what the developers of this test did was they, they took um, patients that were untreated. They had, they, they had diagnosed breast cancer and they had outcomes. And they looked at those patients to see whose breast cancer recurred and whose didn't. And then they ran the entire human genome on each of those samples. So they started with 25,000 candidate genes as opposed to 250, and they let the cancer basically stratify those genes into order of importance, and it developed into a 70-gene test that is now commercially known as Mammoprint. And, and what Mammoprint does differently than Oncotype is it interrogates many more pathways. Oncotype looks at about three different metastatic pathways, mammoprint about seven. And so it's a little bit more sophisticated. It's able to um, it really let the biology of the breast cancer determine which genes were important and stratify them in order of importance. And so that intermediate group has kind of gone away. So mammoprint, you get either a high risk or low risk result. The other huge distinction between the two tests is, is the way Oncotype was validated was on samples of patients that were already treated with five years of, of uh, tamoxifen. So the test only is valid for patients that take tamoxifen for five years. And anyone out there who's listening to this that's on tamoxifen knows it's not an easy drug to take. Uh, and some women just can't tolerate it. Mammoprint was developed on untreated patients. So the results are more pure. So we know, for instance, the numbers I gave you before, a 10% risk of recurrence, that's in untreated patients, and anything you do will reduce that risk. And so there's no preconceived treatment plan that has to be undertaken in order to get your low-risk or high-risk score. But those are really broad strokes about how, how the tests were developed and what the main differences are. Um, but they're, again, they're both commercially available they're both covered by insurance, and, and for early-stage breast cancers, really should be offered to every patient 
with the exception of a patient that you already know is going to need chemotherapy or a patient that could, couldn't tolerate chemotherapy, then there's really no reason to run the test. So why is uh, that not necessarily done? Um, and why, why is that not, why, why does this not necessarily um, given to every patient that comes and walks into an office? Well, Great I can't question, speak, Peter. Yeah, I can't speak for other centers. Uh, you know, at our center here in, at Bonds Corps Cancer Institute in Richmond, every, every eligible patient gets offered this test, bar none. I mean, th- it really has become the standard of care. It, it is in the you know the NCCN guidelines that that genomic testing should be offered to these patients, um, and, and I do think to make decisions regarding chemotherapy on an early stage breast cancer patient without these tests uh, is not good medicine. Uh, now you, you can argue, and it's like any other any other. Uh, um, any other field where there's two competing tests, you'll find people who like one test better than the other. Uh, but the bottom line is run something, you know, use one of the tests at least. But, you know, personally, I like mammoprint tests. I think it's, it's a, again, a second generation test that was developed differently. Um, so, it, it, and it gives you a definitive answer uh, all the time, whereas yes. you don't get an answer about 40% of the time with Oncotype. But again, if it's if it's between running nothing and running something, mm-hmm. I, I would take either test. And I was interested earlier. I was reading the article that you wrote. Um, it's called "Genomic Testing for Breast Cancer: Why and How to Offer It." Um, it's relatively low cost for uh, the facility to run. Um, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of testing. It doesn't look like. Um, and it doesn't require, in a lot of cases, adding extra personnel. Um, you know, I, I just think it's sad that sometimes these things are slow um, jumping into standard of care, but also in the article you mentioned that uh, doctors are overworked and, and they're understaffed in a lot of cases, and they don't have time to keep up with all this. A, a lot of it is educational. I mean, I think... The more the word gets out about these tests, the more you will see all, well, certainly all big cancer centers understand this and all big cancer centers are running this and in the community, it's happening as well. But yeah, you're right. I mean, there are, there are places that, that don't run it, that don't know about it, that feel like it's too much of a burden to set up the system. But, um, like I said in that article, there really is no upfront cost. There's no equipment that you need to buy. It's essentially getting order forms and getting your pathologist to send, um, you know, paraffin embedded specimens after surgery or even on a needle biopsy um, to the company to run the test. So th- there is there is no upfront cost. There is um, no downstream cost. Of course, there's no downstream revenue either for the hospital system, and and I, I don't think that really makes a difference because there are tests we run all the time that that, that are not reimbursable. But, but again, this is, this is an important part of breast cancer therapy. Um, it's, you know, it's comparable in my mind as a surgeon to ultrasound. You know, we use ultrasound every day in our practice. I don't see how you could be a breast surgeon and not use it. And by the same token, I think my medical oncology colleagues would agree. I just don't see how you could make decisions about treating people with chemotherapy for early stage breast cancer or not treating them with chemotherapy without a test like this that's available to add to, uh, to, add to your knowledge base. And again, I, I want to be clear that we still make decisions based on our personal experience, based on our education, based on our knowledge, based on what the patients can, um, the patients can tolerate. So just because you run a genomic test doesn't necessarily mean you absolutely are tied to follow the result. I mean, you have to use some judgment. Medicine, you know, this is the art of medicine, if you will. You know, if you see, um, I'll give you an example. So if an an African, so let's say an African-American woman comes into your office and she's 43 years old and she had a normal mammogram six months ago and now has a breast lump, and you look at that lump, I mean, that historically is going to be an aggressive breast cancer. You know, it showed up in between mammograms. African-American women um, 
historically get more aggressive breast cancers. We know this uh, just from looking at data and papers that have been published time and time again. You biopsy it, and it looks like it's not an aggressive breast cancer. And then you run genomic profiling on it, and the genomic profile test says it is. Well, now there's a discrepancy, and the question is, what are you going to believe? Well, that patient should have an aggressive breast cancer. You would just think that. And if, and if, if the genomic profiling test tells you it is, our tendency would be to believe that. And so you can, you can take those examples in either direction. If you have a 70-year-old patient who has multiple medical problems and, and a breast cancer that looks like it may be aggressive, but the genomic profiling says it isn't, you know, again, statistically, that patient shouldn't have an aggressive breast cancer. And so you may err on the side of, of the genomic profiling in that situation. So, again, these are, these are pieces of a puzzle. It's a big piece of the puzzle, though, and it's a piece that shouldn't be neglected and shouldn't be left out. So when when you look at at uh, some of the, the examples that you gave earlier, people do not like insecurity. Patients are really kind of um, like to have a definite answer when it is possible. So how do you? Um, and as a physician, it is in, in there. You you have a good trying to build a relationship with those patients in terms of treating them in that respect. I mean, how does that affect that patient uh, physician relationship uh, using those tests or deciding not to use those tests? Well, it's a great question, and and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you that that really is one of the criticisms of some of these tests. So, in other words, when you look at the 21 gene genomic test, you know you look at the continuum, and, a lot, and many times people will say, "Well, you know, medicine's not black or white. It's too easy to get a, a test that gives you a yes or no answer." Um, but Every day when we see patients in the office, we're expected to give them a yes or no answer. You know, we can't see a a 45-year-old woman in our office with, you know, three small children and hedge as to whether or not we're going to treat them or not. When they leave our office, they don't want gray. You know, they want black or white. And so that's where I think the second-generation test, the man print test, is, is a little stronger, and it's dichotomous you get a high risk or low risk result. Yes, you have to put it into the puzzle. You have to use some clinical judgment, but we are asked to make yes or no decisions every day as as physicians. Yes, the patient needs surgery. No, they don't need surgery. Yes, they need chemotherapy. No, they they don't. There's no maybes, you know, and even in those gray areas, Mm -hmm. that's when the art comes in and you have to use some judgment based on what you know. And I guess the examples were definitely, um, I mean, evidence of the of, of of how you exercise that judgment. Yes, I mean, in those situations, in those two examples, those are real life examples. By the way, these I'm not making these up. I mean, these are patients that we have, we see, and and patients that come to mind when when we look at uh, utilizing these tests to make sound decisions. But you know, we see, you know, we don't do anything but breast disease in our practice. So we see these patient, types of patients every day, and these tests are, have been invaluable for us. Um, and because having done this for, for a little bit of time now, um, you know, we've seen the complications of chemotherapy. You know, I have a patient that had a bad, you know, uh, adriamycin-associated leukemia and died at 35. You know, so mm-hmm. that doesn't happen often. But it happens, and it only has to happen once to stick in your mind, and and for you to to have you know uh, for you to give some pause and think about, does this patient really need chemotherapy? Is she really going to benefit from it? And what information can I gather um, to make sure I'm making the best decision I can make with the information that I have in hand? Right. Well, I want to I want to get back to the patient for a few minutes. Um, First of all, I love the fact in your article, you mentioned that patients, you're encouraging patients to ask their oncologist to approach their oncologist about the testing. Because for whatever reason, you know, sometimes this uh, information is slow to get to oncologists. So I just want to make that point. It's not really a question. I just want to make that point abundantly clear that as part of, you know, a, a first meeting, you know, if you've been di- diagnosed with breast cancer with whoever the oncologist is that you go to, that you mention to them that you'd very much like genomic testing um, to determine, you know, whether or not you should have further treatment. And, well, before we get to the question on chemotherapy, the second question I had, uh, 
you and I were talking, Dr. Pelican, about um, how this is meshed with mastectomy or lumpectomy decisions. Clarify that a little bit. Well, you know, there's two, there's really two arms to, to breast cancer treatment. One arm is local treatment, how we treat the breast. And then the other is risk reduction. What do, what do we do about the patient's risk of recurrence, not in the breast, but outside the breast? Local therapy is really independent uh, of the second part of that treatment. So you can have a patient that's a perfect candidate for a lumpectomy, you know, has a one centimeter breast cancer in, in, um, has a lumpectomy and has a recurrence outside the breast, and you can and you can have the same uh, uh, vice versa. You can have a patient with a larger breast cancer who needs a who needs a mastectomy, and never recurs their breast cancer. So it's really independent of the local treatment per se. At least now it is. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about what I would call look try, trying to peek into the future a little bit, and as we learn more about genomics, as we learn more about uh, molecular diagnostics and figuring out which breast cancers are aggressive and which ones aren't, we might find, and 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 there's some of this already, you know, people already talking about this, we might find that uh, low-risk patients recur in the breast less often than high-risk patients, and maybe that might guide our surgery, or maybe it might guide us to say, look, this patient is 65 years old, she has a low risk breast cancer that's under a certain size. Maybe she doesn't need radiation therapy, and maybe it will stratify patients um, on their local therapy as well as their distant therapy based on genomic profiling. And the other thing, while we're while we're peeking into the future, you know, there there are companies out there now that are looking at at trying to do bloodborne diagnostics, right? So we're looking at. Um, you know, what we call cell-free DNA or looking at things called exosomes where you'll draw blood and you'll be able to look at different um, molecular profiles within that within the DNA that's in that blood that might be shed from a tumor or just shed from a patient, from an organ of a patient. And maybe you'll be, we'll be able to determine risk based on those blood tests. And then and when you can do that, if I can look, say you can look at a patient and say, you know what, you're not going to get breast cancer, so you don't need mammograms anymore. Now you've fixed or are on the way to fixing the whole overdiagnosis and overtreatment problem. Because now we don't need to do mammograms on the 75 or 80 year old anymore and diagnose these little itty bitty breast cancers that, that are never going to clinic, become clinically significant in some of these women. And even in younger women, if we have the ability to do that just by looking at uh, at, at different profiles and molecular profiles of, of them of their cells, you know, I mean, the, you can think about this uh, forever, and the possibilities I think are endless. And I think ten years from now, or fifteen years from now, we'll have this discussion again, God willing, and we'll think about how how wrong we were today, and how, because of how much we've learned you know, in the ne- over the next decade. Absolutely. So if you, if, if you go back a little bit to uh, the, the different aspects of, of, of the tests, right? Uh, we often talk about molecular subtyping and, and, and that kind of stuff. Can you um, explain a little bit here about um, um, how that is involved with this test? I mean, what, what do you learn from it? Yeah, so molecular subtyping is is fascinating, and we're seeing different molecular subtypes across all different cancers. For breast cancer, right now today, uh, you know, there's essentially four sub or three subtypes. Uh, there's the luminal subtype. The luminal subtype is driven by the by estrogen, or the estrogen pathway, if you will. There's uh, what we call the HER2 dominant or ERBB2 subtype, which is driven by uh, the HER2 pathway, the HER2 gene. And then there's a basal subtype, which is driven by neither. Basal subtypes are typically what people know as triple negative breast cancers. The luminal subtypes are divided into A and B, A being a less aggressive subtype and B being more aggressive. So you're really dealing with four subtypes. And not to get ahead of ourselves, but five years from now or even sooner, we might we're, there's already people talking about different subtypes within each subtype. Um, and that's already that's already known. But for the, for for clinical utility, we essentially talk about those four subtypes. And, what, and, and that is the other benefit of Mammaprint, is Mammaprint right. has another portion to the test called Blueprint, which gives you a molecular subtype. 
And again, this is a true molecular subtype, and, and um, some people try to clinically subtype, which I don't know if we need to get into that now, but essentially mo- molecular subtyping is going to become, or already is, very important uh, because it differentiates um, how aggressive mm-hmm. cancers are, breast cancers, and what their likelihood of recurrence is. And it also gives us an idea of how they're going to respond to treatment. So in other words, if we decide for whatever reason to give a patient chemotherapy before surgery because we want to shrink their tumor or we feel like their, their tumors are very aggressive, we know that those basal subtypes and those HER2 dominant subtypes respond better to that type of therapy. Uh, and that's a good prognostic sign for us. So, I mean, that, that was actually my next question is like knowing somebody's subtype, know, how does it affect the, the, the treatment decisions that uh, you will help make the patient and the patients need, may, may kind of uh, be involved in? Uh, but it's, so the, the test that we talk about in molecular subtyping uh, definitely has an effect on, 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 on guiding you in that respect and, and f- really kind of uh, lead the way to – um, I, I don't call it personalized in this case, more a little bit more individualized kind of approach to, to treating that patient. Well, it's a great question. And, and when, at least here in Richmond um, and across the country, really, we're starting to do more and more what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So giving chemotherapy prior to surgery. And, and here, if we see a patient who's a basal subtype or HER2 dominant subtype, we typically will go ahead and offer them chemotherapy prior to surgery, even if they have a relatively small tumor. So in the old days, meaning five years ago, you know, we were giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy for patients that were initially inoperable. So you just couldn't do surgery on them because the tumors were so locally advanced. Then we progressed a little bit and we said, well, you know what, if we have a patient that has a tumor that's so large that they need a mastectomy to get it out, but they really want to keep their breast, Let's go ahead and give them chemotherapy, try to shrink the tumor, and change them from a mastectomy candidate to a lumpectomy candidate. Now what we're doing more and more is we're using neoadjuvant chemotherapy to, number one, treat patients who we know need chemotherapy to get them treated quicker, regardless of the size of tumor. And number two, on on the research arm, we're looking at neoadjuvant therapies to test new drugs because you can test more drugs in a neoadjuvant setting and get an answer quicker than testing a drug and waiting five years and looking at survival curves. We can extrapolate good outcomes to good responses to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And where molecular subtyping comes in is it it helps us determine who we're going to offer that chemotherapy to based on their subtype. And the other thing that is very fascinating, and again, there is some clinical utility for some of this, but not all of it. So I don't want I don't want to give the impression that we're we're uh, treating patients much differently here. But when you look at molecular subtypes compared to um, protein, uh, you know, protein expression. Mm-hmm. So in other words, right. we test estrogen receptor on all breast cancers, and you see a positive estrogen receptor. And then you look at the subtype, you would expect it to be luminal. But what we're finding a small percentage of the time are what we call estrogen receptor positive basal breast cancer. So in other words, the estrogen receptor is present, but the estrogen receptor is not functioning. So it's not acting like the switch it normally is and turning on that molecular machinery of that estrogen pathway. That pathway is broken. So even though you look at it, it looks like the patient's estrogen positive, They're going to function like a triple negative breast cancer. And that's where you really run the risk of under-treatment. So if you you, you look at a patient and you go, oh, she's estrogen receptor positive, she has a luminal breast cancer, let's just treat her with hormonal therapy. But when you get the true molecular subtype back and it comes back basal, now now your eyes are open because you're thinking, oh my gosh, well, this lady has a non-functional estrogen pathway. She needs chemotherapy. And we're going to treat her with hormonal therapy, but it's probably not going to work very well. And we're seeing the same thing with HER2 patients. So patients that have that HER2 gene or multiple copies of that HER2 gene, about half of them, 50% of them, are luminal subtypes. So even though they have the HER2 gene present, they, they're, they're, um, their cells are really driven by the estrogen pathway. Now, for that, those patients, we don't really know what to do with them yet. There's not a lot of data. It's, it's easy with the estrogen receptor positive basals. They get chemotherapy. With the HER2, clinically HER2 positive, but 
luminal patients, they're still getting chemotherapy and they need to get chemotherapy because that's what the data tells us. But there may come a time in the not too distant future where, where we treat those patients a little bit differently. So again, these are, this is, uh, this is just an exciting time in oncology right. because we are in the infancy uh, of this genomic profiling um, movement and this molecular subtyping movement. And it's just fascinating to be, to be t- doing this because we're learning so much every day. And and I want to make some some points here, um, you know, about what you just said about it being an exciting time. I am so thrilled to have this discussion today because, you know, I think of a woman that um, most p- women that go or have a diagnosis of breast cancer expect that they're automatically going to get chemotherapy. And a lot of times a doctor will come in and sit down with a patient and say, I think you should have chemotherapy. You're basing this on evidence. This is evidence-based. This is, you can walk in and look at a woman and say, based on the evidence of your genomics test, we believe you either A, should have chemotherapy or B, should not have chemotherapy. I think the other really, really important thing is, and I've known so many breast cancer survivors and I've known so many that did not survive. Um, You know, I, I think that it's very important to note that you'll also be able to help them know their risk of recurrence. This is what breast cancer patients live with every single day. And we haven't even touched on metastasis. It also, these genomic tests also uh, give you some indication, correct, as to whether or not the cancer will spread. That's exactly right. And that's based when I, when I say recurrence outside the breast, that's exactly what I'm talking about is metastases. So again, that really is our goal. Our goal is, you know, to keep these cancers from coming back somewhere else. So if they come back in the bone or the liver or the lung, you know, that's what we're trying to avoid. You can, the best way to avoid that is to know what the risk of it happening is. And so if the risk is low, and the chances are very good that it's not going to happen. I mean, there are always outliers, of course, but it, 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 uh, if the risk is low, then you know that those patients don't need cytotoxic or intravenous chemotherapy. Whereas, on the other hand, again, like we spoke about, if it's high, then, then we do need to treat those patients more aggressively. Well, um, I can't believe we're coming to the end of our time together. We only have a couple of minutes left. Um, Dr. Pelican, are there some good resources online about molecular diagnostics and genomic tests? Yeah, I think um, certainly you can go to Agendia's website at agendia.com. You can go to um, knowyourbreastcancer.com, which is K N O. Or uh, you can just mm-hmm. Google know mm-hmm. your breast know your breast uh, know your breast cancer. But that the, the those are probably two good um, good sites to be able to um, at least get started uh, on learning more about uh, these diagnostic tests or what we call prognostic testing. Um, but that, that probably keep people busy quite a while just looking at those two sites. And certainly, um, you can also look up, I, I love these articles by you, and I thank you for taking up the gauntlet on on some of these critical issues and um, continue getting the word out about this. And I, I just want to remind patients that uh, you can ask these questions. It's okay to broach the subject of genomics testing with your doctor. And this is one of the topics that I'm sure that we'll be covering in The Literate Patient, which is a new show that we're going to be starting, uh, Dr. Melissa Stewart and I, on February the 4th, um, which is very exciting. Um, thank you so much, Dr. James Pelicane, uh, for thank being for guest me. today. And uh, as you. always. Dr. Peter Hofflin, thank you so much for being with me today as well. It was nice to uh, be participating in this uh, show. Very, very good stuff. Um, I want to remind everybody that my shows are now available on iHeart Talk Radio, www.iheart.com. Look up Joni Aldrich. And my website is J-O-N-I-A-L-D-R-I-C-H.com. And Peter's 
website, the website, the Oncozine website, is www.oncozine.com. Did I get that right, Peter? Yes, that's correct. It's oncozine.com. You'd think I'd know by now, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure you do. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Please join us tomorrow uh, at 2 p.m. for Ladies Who Inspire. Have a great evening. Thank you.